Hello, uh, welcome to the Best in Heritage 2024. Uh, my name is Jiyoun Kwon, Professor of Arts and Cultural Management at Hongye University in Seoul, Korea. And I'm delighted to have with us today uh, Duncan Dornan, Head of Museums and Collections for Glasgow Life. Uh, he's here to talk uh, to us about a project that was awarded Art Fund Museum of the Year 2023. Welcome, Duncan. So uh, could you please briefly describe the Borough Collection? Yes, I'm delighted to. The, the Borough Collection was created by Sir William Burrell and Lady Constance Burrell uh, in the late 19th and early 20th century. It's so initially a private collection, reflecting the interests and tastes of, of the collectors, but also uh, reflecting a, a substantial amount of background research. Sir William worked very hard to understand the objects he proposed to collect and, and to understand the market he was buying from. Uh, so a diverse collection ranging from Chinese ceramics to uh, French Impressionist works, around 9,000 works in total, uh, which was gifted to the city of Glasgow in 1944. And what was the history of this award-winning museum? Now, what's the rationale, these objectives and aims? So the, the, the Borough Collection uh, was really a hidden gem uh, in Glasgow. Uh, the, when Sir William gifted the collection in 1944, he, in the deed of gift, left uh, a number of uh, very specific stipulations about the location of a museum to house his collection, that the collection had to be housed on its own in a bespoke building. Uh, he didn't want it to be uh, amalgamated into the, the wider city collection. Um, and very particular concerns about the risk of um, environmental contamination for the collection. So though gifted in 1944, and in fact, Sir William uh, continued to live until 1958, um, so, so he was around for quite a long time. It wasn't until 1983 that the, the city finally built and opened a museum to exhibit the borough collection. Uh, and it took a long time to find a suitable location, uh, which eventually was identified in the very centre of Pollock Park in, in the city, in the middle of 360 acres of parkland and, and trees. And the building created was part of an architectural competition. Uh, so the building was designed to be bespoke to the borough collection. Uh, so it's a very uh, substantial um, building and, and um, engages with the natural landscape. Uh, the building was a major move in, in Scottish civic architecture, so it, it was very human scale and very Scandinavian in quality, um, and really aligned very well with the collection and consequently um, was dearly beloved by Glaswegians and many visitors. It was also significant in 83 in that at that time Glasgow was a city suffering from very substantial deindustrialization. And the borough collection uh, was the, the first major step in the city reinventing itself through the use of its cultural assets. So by bringing the, the previously hidden borough collection out for permanent display in a, in a brand new bespoke building in the heart of the city it was a major statement by the city authorities in, in, in its confidence in the cultural assets and, and the future. And that has worked really very successfully. So the borough has become uh, an emblem of Glasgow's success in, in recreating a future for itself and its, its academic future uh, and its cultural and artistic future. So to that extent, it's, it's a very significant and important uh, museum within the, the, the wider cultural landscape in Glasgow. Wow, wonderful. Uh, how impressive. Now, what were the particular qualities or innovations that impressed the Art Fund Museum of the Year Jury 2023? The, um, the, the Art Fund uh, judging panel were, were impressed by uh, the, the enormous extent to which we'd engaged with, um, with communities, with users, and particularly with non-users of the museum uh, to identify ways in which we could improve both the building and the, the experience of access to the collection. Uh, and the extent to which that then appeared in, in the final refurbished museum and the interpretation of that museum, uh, the way in which we had used um, digital um, manual and other interactive forms in addition to interpretation to, to provide platforms for different learning styles. And the, the way in which the engagement went beyond the development phase uh, and was integrated into the operation of the museum post reopening. So we reached out to people who had not been using the museum previously, um, gave them a sense of the collection, um, drew from them what would make the collection interesting for them and make this part of their social and cultural network, um, introduced that into the interpretation, which was at times highly controversial for fine and decorative art, and um, engaged them in an ongoing process to continually evolve and develop the interpretation. Uh, and that through that and programming to ensure that, that under, under non-users, who we've enticed in um, don't revert back to being non-users. 
that having open channels to bring new people into the collection, that momentum continues and the collection continues to be accessible. So th those were the things really that were key to the art fund decision. Uh, and uh, those things sometimes happen in museums, but I think they were conscious that a fine and decorative art museum, particularly one with this particular range of collection materials, is not obviously a uh, museum which lends itself to that approach. And at the same time that being able to provide that level of community connection and engagement um, at, first, at the same time providing a museum which aesthetically um, and spiritually was effective for a conventional visitor to find a decorative art collection, someone who really understood the, the significance of the collection uh, and, and, and was comfortable in that environment, that that had to simultaneously coexist with the, the, the more social aspects and the borough had managed to successfully deliver those two things. So our digital content, not overwhelming the collection uh, and the, the fundamental quality of the collection, but supporting and providing access. Right, community engagement, that's a challenge for a lot of museums. Now, what were some of the difficulties that you faced or challenges? And also, you may probably had some positive experiences uh, during the re realization of this refurbishment project. Uh, one of the, the key difficulties, and, and I think we'll come to this later, was, was the building. Um, so the building uh, had been designed for the collection. It was a very ambitious uh, piece of architecture in the, the late 70s and early 80s when it was created. Um, the, the technology at that time um, arguably was not equal to delivering the aspiration of the architects. And so the building we had in, 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 in the, the, the early 21st century um, suffered very badly from heat loss uh, and heat ingress for, Light was a major problem in displaying this collection. Uh, the building leaked very badly uh, and, and, and allowed water in, um, and was was very expensive to manage. So, so that 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 these were major difficulties with the architecture. Um, people also found the building hard to, to navigate and negotiate. And yet, at the same time, this was a Grade A listed building, the highest listing possible in Scotland, and and very much loved by many people because the atmosphere and ambience of the building is, is wonderful and very tranquil. And so our challenge, one of the key challenges was how to make the building genuinely functional in environmental terms and in human terms, whilst at the same time not losing those aspects of it which actually made it appealing to existing audiences. And that, that was a difficult compromise to, 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 to progress. The other difficulty was that we, we believed extensive use of digital interpretation would be necessary to provide the level of access we required and to, to cater for the broadest possible range of learning styles. But again, the application of digital to a fine and decorative art collection was certainly within Scotland and the UK regarded as being highly controversial. And there was a concern that the digital would overwhelm the cause of the collection. So those were the, the two major challenges we had and a huge amount of work had to go into to reconciling those conflicting aspirations and demands and, and those fears. Um, so that was probably the most difficult thing. The positive experience, I think, was the way in which it, it very quickly became clear as we were reaching out to, to non-user communities that um, pe people were enthused by and interested in these collection objects, that the but they needed to feel that they had a channel in, an intellectual channel into the object, and that the institution genuinely cared about them. So we took collection objects out into the community as one of the early steps to allow people to see them and talk about them and to find ways in which people wanted to consider these objects. We have a very touching story. Um, we took some objects to uh, a, a, a mother and toddler group in, in Glasgow in a part of the city near the collection, near the museum, which people didn't, didn't visit at all. Um, and we took pictures of the collection just to show the range of material we had. Um, and we did a, a follow-up session with some, some live objects. And in the second session, one of the, the, the mothers had come up and said, I really have to apologize. My little boy took some of your pictures home after the last session and he created a museum of his own on, on the wall of his bedroom. Uh, and we thought that was a wonderful story because this little boy who lived in a, a community which had previously not engaged with this collection at all, had mm -hmm. seen no relevance to it, had created his own tiny burrow in his bedroom of, of, of fine and decorative art objects of armour. And, and so that was, a, I think, a remarkable change. And we were really very proud of that. But it indicates that the shift that can be achieved, you know, that actually, if people are given the opportunity, um, then they will, they will actually change. Wonderful. You had a lasting impact on this boy. Uh, Absolutely. It changed his life. Now, um, you put a lot of effort in community engagement. Can you tell us a little bit about how you achieved accessibility to different community groups and, and you were able to transform your museum into a more welcoming place? 
I, absolutely. So the the the, the key um, step with community groups was, was to to reach out to people within their own communities. So we took objects into communities. Uh, we worked with a range of groups. Um, I've mentioned toddler groups, but also um, uh, Muslim groups in the city, um, breakfast clubs, older people's groups. Um, we took objects to communities. Um, used our networks, which are previously established, to, to, to make links into to groups, particularly groups um, who, whose ancestry would have connections to the objects in the collection. So the, you know, the, the, the Chinese community in, in Glasgow, um, Iranian communities, many of the textiles and some of the ceramics come from, 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 uh, from Iran. Um, and, and there are communities in Glasgow who, can, um, who are able to talk about these objects, but from the perspective of the people who made them and the societies to which they originally belonged, and that, that was a way of, of drawing people in. Uh, for others uh, uh, who, who don't have those sorts of connections, we looked at the materiality of the, cl the collection. So, uh, for example, the, the, the furniture and, and some of the, 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 the wooden items in the collection, um, Glaswegians will have family members who are joiners who work in, in, in those industries. So actually by identifying that, if, even if you don't think there's a connection, Actually, your family have a connection. The people who made this have the same skills as your family members, but you know, in a different place and at a different time. And that's a link in. You can understand the, 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 the artisanship they brought to this. You can begin to think about their domestic circumstances, where they sat in society, and, and, and therefore where these objects sit in society relative to ones you're familiar with. And those channels allow people to begin to rethink the collection um, and to understand pathways into enjoying the collection. And that was really a critical part of the work. And what we did was, was work with those communities to develop um, strands of the interpretation. So we've produced um, a wide range of digital, but that looks at other stories as a way of, of giving access to the collection. Uh, the way in which we've displayed the collection allows us in, a, in some galleries to focus on material. So we have a gallery looking at, um, at stonework, at sculpture, at, at pastels. That's to try and link into existing communities in Glasgow. Um, and we worked with people to, to, to identify how the objects would connect into their contemporary stories. And some displays reflect that. So by using a range of stories, developed with communities through the galleries, we provide multiple pathways in for people to begin to access the collection, mm -hmm. um, but as routes to being able to enjoy the collection in a more conventional manner. So ultimately these are channels used on a temporary basis to, to the point where people are, know the collection. And we saw that in some of the first visitors. So some of our community groups would rush in on the, the, the day we opened first and we invited them into the museum first to see their object. They knew where the armour was and they knew the story behind it and they wanted to share with their friends and family and that's exactly who we wanted to be. And you're lucky you have such an eclectic collection, you know, that could respond to your multicultural community as well, it seems like. Uh, absolutely, yes, the diversity of the collection was hugely helpful. Right, that's a strength. Uh, now, what kinds of new interpretive methodologies did you adopt in the display of your collection or in order to meet the audience's expectations in the digital world? Um, so we, we adopted a, a range of approaches. Um, this was very carefully considered and structured. Um, the, uh, the written interpretation, we, we have um, very firm guidelines about the volume of text we supply and, and, and so that we don't overwhelm people with, with, with written words and we know that that doesn't work. So we, need to, we, we, we did a lot of research to maximise the amount of information people could take from us. So the, the length of text is carefully calibrated. Um, we adopted an approach of trying to find ways in which the collection through interpretation can tell stories. So that rather than just the date of the object and the, the, the source community, it, we find some background narrative and, and things which will, will, will chime with a contemporary audience. So the historic experiences, which are similar to contemporary ones. Uh, across the displayed channels, um, the, the digital films, digital interactives, games, um, manual interactives, um, tactile elements, uh, and conventional interpretation, we were very careful to ensure that we covered uh, the five key learning uh, skills that people use. So if you like to learn by watching, there are films, you can do that visually. If you like to learn by listening, we have audio, uh, tactile and, and physical interactives. Um, so we, we have all five ranges. We ensured also that across all those, those delivery models, we had content aimed at the key audiences. So if you're a, a young person who learns by watching film, there are films aimed specifically at a young age demographic. If you're an older person who learns by interacting, there are interactives aimed at a, an older, more informed audience. So we, we ensure that across the galleries, uh, we're able to find something that links very strongly to each individual, both in terms of their age demographic 
and the way in which they would choose to learn. Um, the digital um, content, we were very careful um, because we were concerned about digital potentially overwhelming a collection, which is essentially visual in nature. Mm -hmm. And so the, the scale of the digital was, was we, we carried out a huge amount of research to, to get that right. Um, surprisingly, we discovered that larger digital installations were more discreet. Um, and in fact, since opening, we, we've, we've more or less abandoned the iPad sized interpretation as being intrusive and not really used very much. And, and, and we've moved to much to blade, large scale blade interpretation because it, it, it sits more comfortably within the landscape. Um, and uh, the color palette is very carefully selected to be sufficiently gentle that it, it sits behind the collection rather than overwhelming it. Uh, in delivering sound, we, we have quite a lot of audio. Um, the sound levels are very carefully calibrated so they don't contaminate the gallery. It, it, it's for people who are close to the, the interactive unit. Um, and that means that we can maintain the, the tranquility for which Borough was, was very famous. Um, interestingly, it, 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 in all of our museums, we have seven across the city. Uh, the Borough is one in which people sit down most. So people will sit to contemplate the object and we find contemplate the digital which supports the object. And that was really a, a, an aspiration. We wanted people to be able to, um, to dwell and, and, and to engage with the collection. Um, and, and the design of the building is very successful in that um, even when it's really busy, it still feels quiet and tranquil. So ch children can run around and enjoy themselves, but it doesn't interfere with the, the experience of someone who wants that, that very calm, tranquil engagement with the borough collection. Wow, all that thought and sensitivity that went into the designs of the environment. Wow. Now, I also understand that you made great efforts to meet the sustainable goals uh, in the age of climate crisis. Can you tell us how you did that? Yeah, absolutely. So the, the, the borough, as I said earlier, was designed as, bes as a bespoke building for this collection. Uh, for many reasons that the building, although it had been very popular and the aesthetics of the building were very popular, it, in many respects it had failed. So the, 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 the visitor studies and tracking studies we carried out indicated that people found orientation around the building quite difficult. They, they got lost very easily. Um, there was only a, a single public entrance and people found that meant that it was that was intimidating and, and genuine engagement with the, the, with the Pollock Park around the building was quite difficult. Um, so we had to find ways to, to deal with those issues within a Grady listed building. Uh, but in terms of the, the, the performance of the building and, and, and in relation to climate change, uh, the, the building previously was, was extremely poor. The, 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 the wasn't airtight. It leaked very badly, both water and air. Um, the glazing was, was fairly simple. So we had enormous heat ingress and warm conditions, enormous heat loss and cold conditions, uh, high levels of light contamination, which made it very difficult to, to rotate and display the collection. Um, so all of those things had to be addressed in, in, in the refurbishment. And we were aware at that time that we had to move as close as we could to, to being a net zero museum. So we had to try to generate in low carbon power in the borough and, and to, 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 to maximise our control of that. Uh, so the, um, the, the plant is, 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 is highly efficient and modern and we have a, a really high level of control over the plant. We've installed photovoltaic cells to generate electricity on the flat roof of the building. Um, it works really well in the museum because we generally use large amounts of electricity during daylight hours, so it's a perfect mix. Um, but we can store surplus electricity and use that to recharge electric vehicles in the car park. And we can also take electricity from the grid at times where there's lower demand. So we can use um, renewably generated electricity from the grid and there's a large amount of renewable electricity in Scotland, recharge our batteries uh, and then back that up with PV during the day. So the electricity system is, is highly efficient. Um, the building is, is air tightness is extremely high. Uh, with Briam Excellent, which is a, a major achievement for a museum. Um, the glazing works incredibly hard. So we, we've managed without changing the visual appearance of it, uh, to, to give a high level of control of heat coming into the building, high level of control of heat loss, and very high levels of control of light levels, which means that our energy consumption can be really very carefully fine-tuned. Um, and we're able to, to, to maintain the borough within very carefully set parameters. Um, so that was one of the major aspirations. Also in the project, we replaced 80% of the external fabric of the building. All of the glass was recycled. We retained many of the structural units that held the glass. So we reused as much as possible where we couldn't reuse material, that material was recycled on site. So we're conscious that both the impact of the project, but also the, the, the ongoing operational impact of the museum was minimized. Um, and that's been hugely successful. The borough is now by some margin our most efficient museum. Uh, we, we have very high levels of control 
And we've been able to, since opening, very substantially further reduce the energy consumption of the building by absolutely fine-tuning the, the environmental management. So that, that aspect of it was important. Our consultants and contractors did an outstanding job in responding to the brief and genuine delivering within what was, in the end, a pre-existing structure. So actually to, to make these improvements within a building which, you know, which by that stage, um, more than 40 years old, has, I think, been a, a massive achievement. Mm -hmm. Wow, congratulations. Now, to wrap, to wrap up the talk, can you tell us what the outcome was of all these transformative efforts? I, absolutely. So the, the, the outcome has, has, has been absolutely fantastic. Um, the, the borough uh, reopened uh, two years ago uh, it, it, to a, a hugely positive response. Um, uh, d despite the, the, the perhaps controversial approach to using digital within this, this format of collection. Uh, actually, um, the, 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 the public response and the, the press response and, 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 um, and, and the critical response was overwhelmingly positive. 97% of us would think the borough interpretation is good or very good. 100% of visitors would recommend it to their friends. Um, we had increased the audience Prior to refurbishment in the final year in 2016, we had 160,000 visitors. Um, in the first year after reopening, that was 600,000 visitors. Yeah. We've seen a, a massive increase in international tourists, which are now about 55% of the audience, which is, is very good for the city. But equally, equally, we have successfully diversified the audience. So those local communities who weren't visiting are attending. And, uh, and they're engaging with the museum and with programmes in the museum. And we're finding that, that more and more groups are coming and engaging with us and, and we're delivering new content for them. So that drive to diversify has, has, been, has been really very effective. Uh, I've already touched on the environmental issues, so the building is proving to be as efficient to run as we'd hoped. Um, the, the linkages and the improvements to circulation have also been highly effective. Um, as you'll be aware in museums very frequently, um, orientation signage is one of the, 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 the real areas of contention and people are always complaining that the orientation signage isn't very good. Um, in the borough, because of the careful um, changes to the architecture, we never get complaints about orientation signage, but largely because it's not necessary. The building is entirely intuitive and people can, can, can find their way around. So that, that's been hugely effective. And the, the increasing, uh, the, the access to the park has finally genuinely connected the collection to the natural environment, which is really the aspiration of the building originally, and I think an aspiration of boroughs. So that 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 destination has finally placed the collection and, and museum within the park in the way that it's originally aspired to. Um, and I think the I think what it's done is is, is make um, perhaps one of the, the most remote uh, and, a, and obscure types of collection in the city um, genuinely accessible to people and something that people feel a really strong sense of ownership, which is absolutely no where we were before. Yeah. Wonderful. Well, my heartfelt congratulations, and I wish you Thank all you. the best for your future endeavours and the best for the Borough Collection for, uh, you know, uh, to be become a significant uh, landmark in your community. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for being with us. Love to talk to you. Bye-bye. Yeah.